everyone. Welcome to today's e-seminar from Simulia, providing an update on new enhancements in the July 2014 releases of Abacus 6.14 and Episafe 6.5. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a table of contents for today's e-seminar, allowing you to skip around and view the material in any order that you'd like. Before we get to today's technical content, let me provide you with a brief overview of Dasso Systems and Simulia. Dasso Systems is the 3D experience company. We have a very large worldwide team of passionate people based on combining science, technology, and art for a sustainable society. We have a very large number of enterprise customers, 3,500 partners, and are driven by a long-term view of the role of 3D technology in society. Simulia is the Dasso Systems brand for realistic simulation. We have 1,000 employees, 29 offices, which we call centers of simulation excellence throughout the world, and almost 150 value solution partners worldwide. We are a technology-driven brand. We have invested heavily in our R&D over the years, and that investment is not slowing down at all, despite the fact that we are now a part of a much larger organization. At Simulia, we believe a revolution in simulation is at the beginning. This revolution will take simulation from the department level and spread it across the enterprise because many customers are asking us today to power their sustainable in innovation processes with realistic simulation. So we're doing two things. First of all, we are putting simulation technology on Deso Systems 3D Experience platform. But for today's audience, our second action is the most important. We are continuing to assemble and build the best-in-class uh, suite of simulation technology and simulation products to power that platform. Those products are available to all users today, as you see on the screen. These products are Abacus, Eyesight, Tosca, and FeSafe. In addition to assembling the suite of products, we are now producing, providing these products to you using what we call our extended packaging licensing. This is important because it provides all users through a single license agreement, a single set of tokens, and a single purchasing and budget request with access to all four of these products. So any user today of Abacus, Eyesight, Tosca, and FeSafe through the extended packaging licensing can get access to the remaining products. All right, let's move on and introduce today's uh, first speaker. Presenting the Abacus 614 update, Chris Walliver. Chris is the development manager for the Simulia Mechanics Group and has been with the company for 15 years. Chris? Okay, thank you very much, Dale. And welcome, everybody, to the uh, 614 update. Quite happy to be here today. So I hope you'll find this, uh, this presentation useful, and, um, and uh, I think you'll be impressed with some of the new features that are coming at 614. So um, I have an overview slide here. I am, the presentation is broken up into a number of topics. Uh, we'll start with contact and constraints, go on to materials and mechanics, co-simulation, some performance slides, linear dynamics, and we'll finish up with Abacus CAE. Um, during the presentation, you'll see that I have, um, I will have uh, different overview slides that will list some of the uh, development that's happened in these different areas. I will go into a deeper dive and a little more detail on some of those topics. Some of them I'll just mention very quickly, and some of the topics that some of the development that's been done in 614 actually won't show up in the overview slides. And at the end, I'll refer you to the release notes just because um, there's typically so much development done during the year that we, we can't include everything. So with that, um, I'll start uh, with uh, contact and constraints. 
Um, as usual, or over the past year, our contact team has continued to improve the robustness and uh, usability of general contact and abacus. Um, the, some of the uh, big development that I'm really going to focus on is the first thing, the edge-to-edge -edge contact for shells to, and solids. Um, but other things that uh, have been put in is uh, better overall energy balances for problems using penalty contact, some improved handling of shell offsets at complex intersections and abacus explicit, and also a domain decomposition for thermal ties uh, inside abacus explicit as well. But I, I am going to focus mostly on the edge-to-edge -edge contact for shells and solids. So if you look here at the animation that's running, you see a ring of continuum elements that's being pulled through another ring. Um, this is an excellent example which shows the robustness not of only just the general contact and abacus standard, but also the importance of, of being able to resolve uh, this edge-to-edge -edge contact. And I, and I want to point out that this, this is an implicit analysis. This is not explicit. Um, this is an analysis of a very flexible structure going through a non-trivial buckling mode while being pulled through that second ring. And I imagine that a couple of years ago, I imagine that most people wouldn't have guessed we could have done this type of analysis efficiently in, inside, an, inside of Implicit. So, um, so what is the edge-to-edge -edge contact? And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the ability to uh, model the contact between solids and shells that are uh, interacting with each other on the on the edges. This is extremely important in some cases for properly resolving the contact pressures uh, between structures, and it uh, uh, it goes along with some of the work we've already done uh, for contact between edges with beams. So this is a summary slide showing sort of the progression of the uh, contact work that's been done over the last couple of releases as part of this general push for getting uh, general contact into, into Abacus standard. The uh, new development is the animation you see running on the bottom, and that's the uh, edge-to-edge -edge formulation. You see this is kind of an academic example of just uh, of two shell structures which are interacting purely on, on the edges. So if you look at the, the table on, on the lower right-hand side, it, it illustrates the different types of contact that we've been working on uh, as a function of the, uh, of the different releases. So if you look at the last column there in 614, you see that, in, that we now support um, the edge-to-edge the, uh, -edge contact for solids and shells. Um, here's a couple of just kind of nice animations uh, showing, you know, two examples where this edge-to-edge -edge contact is important. The first one is just is a, a you know, a 3D uh, continuum analysis of um, of a hook. Uh, yeah, that, that that those are discretized with with 3D elements. You can't see the mesh there, but that's what it is. And if you look there on the bottom left, you see there uh, the contact uh, pressures um, or the MISA. That's actually a, a, a contour of the MISA stresses. Um, in the vicinity of the contact between the two edges. And you can see that clearly this is a case where accurate resolution of the, uh, of the contact at those edges is, is critical for getting the proper uh, stress fields in the region of the contact. And these types of uh, accurate stress resolutions are extremely important, especially if you uh, want to do a failure analysis or a fatigue analysis later on. The analysis uh, the animation you see on the right, again, it's just kind of a fun example. It's the uh, it's a, a couple of washers that are being uh, dropped um, under gravity load and held up by a string. The string is modeled with uh, beam elements, and the uh, washers are being modeled again with 3D continuum elements. And again, you can see there that uh, you know the, the the importance of being able to resolve the uh, edge to edge contact uh, for for a model like this. So. Um, I want to move on and talk a little bit about uh, uh, some work we did to improve contact at complex intersections in Abacus Explicit. This work is really focused on cases where you have uh, shell structures that are uh, being put together where the shells are, um, uh, at, uh, are lined up and uh, orthogonal to each other. Whenever we have shells that a, at a come together at an intersection, there's always some modeling approximations that have to go on because the shells are modeled as 2D structures, but to handle the contact, you need to be able to keep track of where are the actual surfaces of these shells. And that includes what's happening, you know, where the, where are the surfaces at the edges. 
Um, in early releases of Abacus, um, in, with Explicit, when you had these complex T intersections, um, there was a little bit of discrepancy on how we were modeling where the surface was at the edges of the shells. And so you can see in the upper portion of this, this is a, this is, these are the shell models. Um, you know, again, we have uh, shell elements coming in together uh, uh, at, at angles to each other. And then we're taking these two structures and we're pushing them together. And if you see that the, uh, the, the uh, picture on the upper uh, right-hand side, the, these two structures should come together with, with you know, very little localized stress. But you can see there um, that you can actually we see that there's some artificial uh, contact pressures being developed. Um, we've what we've done is we've uh, in 614 you show seen on the bottom is that we've improved the uh, calculation of the, where the location of these surfaces are. And now when you bring these two structures together, you see you know you see very little noise, you know very little hot spot in the actual contact there. So this should help it make it easier for you to to create models. Um, uh, with these complex intersections and get the, the correct contact pressures um, as you put these together. So those are just a couple of the uh, enhancements that uh, uh, were done in contact. Um, I want to move now on to work that's been done in and for materials. Um, our materials team has been very busy this year, um, and here's a list of some of the work that's been done. Um, we've uh, continued work on our parallel rheological framework for modeling nonlinear viscoelasticity. This is, uh, you know, this is the animation you see here of a rubber bushing. This, this works very relevant to these types of models. We've introduced the uh, three new creep laws that are well suited for solder alloys. We have a more integrated C zone composition crust solution. Um, we've enhanced our, uh, our cohesive elements for traction separation. Um, and done some more work on our UMATs for hybrid elements. Um, we've increased uh, the number of output variables available for output and also uh, have um, enabled uh, element deletion and standards. So I'll go into more details on, on most of these in the next couple slides. The first one I want to talk about is enhancements to our, uh, the PRF model. So over the last uh, three years, our materials team has been developing a comprehensive framework for modeling nonlinear viscoelastic materials. This is the PRF. The framework supports uh, general finite strain viscoelastic and elastic plastic behavior, inclu including stress softening and creep. In 614, this support has been expanded to include kinematic hardening, uh, new power creep laws, and also fully supports import between standard and explicit. The wide range of behaviors that we support now for this framework allows for modeling very complex material behaviors commonly found in rubber and polymer materials. The, uh, the stress strain curve or the loading curve you see here on the right hand side is, is an excellent example of the complex behaviors that you can see uh, in rubber materials. You can have a primary uh, elastic response curve you see there on the top, but you can have complex behavior when you unload. You can have phenomena like permanent set, which indicates permanent damage in the material. You can have hysteresis curves as a, as a sample is loaded and unloaded, and uh, softening due to uh, damage or Mullins effect. So our, 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 the goal of this work is, is to be able to provide you with the tools you need to calibrate your models to reproduce this type of complex behavior. Um, next, I just want to quickly talk about, we have three new creep models that are available in Abacus Standard. These uh, models are the for um, uh, are well suited for modeling solder alloys. These are the ANAD, the Darvo, and the double power laws. Um, these are these are industry standards. They had been available previously as, as built-in UMATs, but now they're they're fully integrated into Abacus standard. Um, so this should, uh, if you use these types of uh, models, this will uh, make it much easier for you to, to use these in your analyses. We also have a more integrated C-Zone solution for Abacus Explicit. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, C-Zone is a composite crush model. Um, the animation or, that you see running here on the left is, a, uh, is, a, uh, is a, an experiment where um, there's a composite crush happening in front. We're looking at the, a top view. And the animation you see on the right is an Abacus simulation of that, of that same solution. So the, and this, this, uh, this enhancement 
um, is mostly a usability enhancement. We've integrated this uh, C-Zone capability completely inside of Abacus. Uh, in previous releases, you needed to use um, some Python scripts to, to invoke this capability. But now it's it's a uh, it's a much more integrated solution. So again, this is uh, will make your life easier if you use these types of analysis. Um, I mentioned we'd have some enhancements to traction separation elasticity. This is for our cohesive elements, and and this development allows you to find different elastic stiffness and tension and compression. So this is something. This has actually been a fairly heavily requested enhancement. And this is important in cases where there might be some type of mechanism in a cohesive layer, um, some type of fibers or some type of, of physical structure that leads to uh, different uh, apparent stiffnesses uh, in these thin layers when you have tension and compression. So uh, uh, this, this uh, development um, you know, will allow you to, to put those two different behaviors in. And again, it just it helps you increase the, the fidelity of your models and, and expand the types of, uh, of, of, of um, simulations you can do uh, with, our, with our cohesive elements. Uh, moving on to UMAT support, uh, in, for Abacus Standard, in previous releases, you know, we, we have UMATs, which is a, uh, our user subroutine for allowing you to put your own material behaviors inside of Abacus. It's, it's, a, it's a way that we open up the code to let you get your proprietary information in there. Um, but in previous releases, if you were trying to model nearly incompressible or fully incompressible materials um, with our hybrid elements, the, you would see different convergence uh, behaviors uh, between your models and if we had native models built into Abacus. This was partially due to the way we were handling Lagrange multipliers for, for hybrid elements. But in uh, 6.14, uh, we have uh, enhanced the interface for UMass for hybrid elements. Um, and now the convergence behaviors between the, uh, the hybrid formulation using UMAT and one that would be natively installed in, inside of Abacus are identical. So again, this again this opens up a um, uh, you know an, an avenue for you to get your own models into Abacus and and, and still be able to get the convergence that you need. Um, element deletion in standard again, this is a this is something that's been available in Abacus Explicit for some time, and it's been a, a fairly heavily requested uh, 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 feature. Um, and so basically, it, it gives you the ability to define conditions on when an element in standard uh, should start damaging. And when the damage is complete, uh, the element is actually removed from the analysis, and so its stiffness contribution disappears. Um, so this, this is, again, this is behavior that's been available and explicit for some time, and we're just now matching it in Abacus standard. The last uh, enhancement for the materials that I want to talk about is a, is a new output variable. Um, or actually two output variables, and these are for uh, giving you a way of seeing the importance of mode mixity in delamination problems. So um, when in our cohesive elements, uh, when they fail, typically the failure is uh, of two kinds, either a mode one or mode two, so either something failing due to tension or due to shear. Um, we have two output variables now that you can use to tell you what the relative mix of these two uh, failure modes are, um, it, uh, the, on the graph on the on the lower left, um, it's showing you the mode mixity of the failure um, at the at the uh, when the damage initiates. So what we have this this picture here is a standard sort of delamination. It's a picture of a of, a, of an experimental setup for for uh, modeling for measuring delamination. Um, in, a, in some type of laminate. And the, um, the output variable on the, on the lower left is showing you the initial mode mixity, and um, values near 1 indicate that, the, uh, that, the, um, uh, that it's mostly a mode 1 failure. And as it heads down towards 0, it's heading down towards a mode 2 failure. So that's uh, what you're seeing on the lower right-hand side. Is, is the evolution of the mode mixity as uh, um, as analysis progresses. So again, it's, it's a somewhat of a you know small uh, enhancement, but actually quite useful if if you if you're studying uh, if you if you do delamination simulations. 
Okay, I um, want to move on now to uh, some enhancements in mechanics. And again, we've been quite busy in the mechanics uh, team over the past year. Um, the enhancements here that uh, is uh, we have some work done on expanding uh, our XFIM capability for coupled pore pressure analysis. We've done actually a number of uh, enhancements to XFIM, which I'll talk about. Um, um, we've put some uh, improve some output uh, capabilities for Abacus Standard that allows you to see what happens if the analysis stops converging. Um, we have a number of enhancements for cells, some improved accuracy for our VCCT. Um, VCCT is, is another way of doing delamination studies as a, kind of an alternative to cohesive elements. We've introduced a new acoustic pyramid element and enhanced some of our surface-based fluid cavities and standards. So again, I'm I'm only going to focus on the XFEM in the cell in detail in the next couple of slides, and again, I will refer you to the release manual for the for the other enhancements that I mentioned. But the first one I want to talk about is our XFEM for pore pressure displacement analysis. Um, in 6.14, we've combined the general fracture capabilities of uh, XFEM, or the extended finite element method, with our coupled pore pressure displacement procedures to allow Abacus to realistically model arbitrarily driven hydraulic fractures in axially symmetric two- and three-dimensional domains. And the goal of this work is to start providing a new set of advanced simulation capabilities to improve the understanding of hydraulic fracture. The animation that you see running down here is a hydraulic fracture of an invertebral disc. Um, on the, on the, the meshed animation that you see on the lower right, you can see there's an initial fracture uh, inside this disc. This disc is, has, uh, is permeated with a fluid, and as it's compressed past a certain point, uh, the fluid inside that crack is compressed, and it forces its way out of the initial fracture and initiates fracture further on in that disc. And so this is the type of analysis that we're targeting. Um, it also has applications uh, in the oil and gas industry for hydraulic fracturing. Um, so we're quite excited about this uh, this new functionality. As I mentioned, um, with this we have a we support a full set of first order axisymmetric 2D and three dimensional coupled pore pressure displacement element elements. Um, we support both the initiation and propagation of of hydraulically induced fracture. Um, we uh, handle both geostatic and consolidation analysis, so we handle both steady state and transient. Uh, solutions, and we can also handle a small sliding contact with friction between the the hydraulic fractures. So this is a, this is a, you know very exciting new development for us, and and we are going to continue this work. Um, another enhancement for XFEM is is work done to uh, try to improve the crack propagation direction calculations for unstructured tet meshes. Um, the the idea here is that when we're trying to compute the uh, fractured directions, um, we need to look at the stress field ahead of the crack tip. And for unstructured tet meshes, um, as you might know, the stress field can actually be somewhat noisy. Um, this is just a fun, fundamental feature of, of these first order tet elements. And the effect of that noise can be that there can be some slight the uh, inaccuracies in our propagation direction. So if you look at the animation um, running on the right, this is a mode one fracture of a structured tet mesh. And you can see that, you know, on the right, this is using the sort of default local averaging for the stress field ahead of the crack tip. You get a basically a mode one crack, but if you look closely, you can see that it's not a clean fracture. And so what we've done in 614 is we've introduced a new non-local averaging scheme where we actually are averaging the stress field ahead of the crack tip. And uh, the effect of this is it tends to smooth out some of the noise you see for these for these uh, for these tet meshes. And the animation that's running on the left uh, with the non-local averaging, you can actually see that you get a much cleaner uh, uh, much cleaner fracture surface. This is what you is really what you should get from uh you know for this particular analysis. So again this you know this will in general help improve the uh, fracture calculations that you get with XFEM for for coarser meshes. 
Um, another enhancement for XFEM is the introduction of, of a dynamic XFEM surfaces. Um, what we have here is an example of a mode 2 crack. Um, we're using XFEM. On the right-hand side, you see what we uh, provided in early releases as far as uh, visualization of this crack. This is, you're actually seeing, this is from Abacus Viewer. You're seeing the actually the level set that we use for keeping track of the fracture inside of XFEM. But that surface there, that level set, is not an actual Abacus surface. So inside of Viewer, the uh, post-processing uh, uh, support is, 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 not that, uh, is not that complete. And what we so what we've done in 614 is we uh, is the animation you see uh, in the middle there of that of that red surface as the X frame fracture propagates we're actually dynamically creating a traditional abacus surface using uh, 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 three noted surface elements and we're we're meshing basically we're creating a mesh on that uh, that X frame surface and so. Um, you'll see on the next slide the the advantage of this is that now um, uh, you can actually go into Abacus Viewer and you can probe that surface because there's real nodes on there for the for the probe tool, the query tool to see. So this is a for us is a first step in you know providing uh, more surface related functionality for our XFEM. Um, in 6.14, it's mostly restricted to uh, just enhanced output capabilities and post-processing capabilities, but it also lays the framework for future work where we actually can do more with these surfaces and XFEM analysis, such as supplying uh, a wider variety of loads and contact conditions. Um, this slide, we're talking about output at the last converged increment in, in Abacus Standard. Uh, this uh, I think is again another heavily requested feature, um, and the target here is for unstable problems such as those uh, with contact or fracture propagation or bucking simulations that can sometimes run into convergence issues. So the uh, we do everything we can to prevent you know from simulations from failing to converge, but still in some cases, especially for these highly nonlinear problems, convergence can be a problem. And that can be frustrating. What is even more frustrating if you don't have any output near the last converged increment. So what we've done in 6.14 is now by default, if you run a general step in Abacus Standard, which fails to converge, we will automatically output all the requested output at the last converged uh, frame. So this, the, the picture here is a, is a nonlinear buckling analysis of, of, a, of, a, uh, of a structure. We have a snippet here of the status file, so you can see that box in red is the last converged increment at increment 23, and you can see at increment 24 the job was unable to converge. Um, but what we do now is we we automatically will output all the results at that last increment, so at least you can see what happened right before the analysis stopped, and maybe you're able to use that information to help understand uh, why the why the job. Uh, stopped converging. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this section, we have done some uh, enhancements to our uh, coupled or layering Lagrangian capability, our cell analysis, and uh, some of this work is focused on supporting material orientation in cell. This is something uh, we, we didn't support previously, and so this is just an animation showing, these are just showing, uh, this is just a, uh, uh, a um, uh, a contact analysis with a you know with a structure we have a rigid punch coming down and hitting an Eulerian uh, model of a of, of some type of material and what you're seeing there is actually the uh, material orientation directions which are which are uh, being updated as the analysis continues so the advantage of this or the the use of this is twofold one it allows us now to fully support anisotropic materials uh, using our cell analysis, just, which, is, uh, very, which is very powerful. But at the same time, it also improves the robustness for uh, our hyperelastic materials because the same technology used for keeping track of the directions can be used for uh, properly modeling the deformation gradient for our hyperelastic materials. And this is very important uh, for modeling rubbers and also for applications inside of uh, life science. The slide I have up here 
there's a needle penetration into soft tissue, which is done with cell. Um, but in life sciences, you know, in, in soft tissue models are often anisotropic, anisotropic hyperelastic materials. So this development now lets us do these types of simulations more robustly, more accurately uh, inside a cell. So this, this is, again, quite a nice enhancement. Um, also with cell, we've, uh, over the last couple of years, we've been working on an adaptive re mesh refinement capability, or AMR. Um, we've continued in 614 to improve the robustness of this and the performance. Um, the, the animation that you see here is a wheel running through some type of soil. And you can see this is using four levels of refinement. You know, and so the, the advantage here is that the um, you know, that you're able to refine the mesh only in regions of the, of the domain where it needs to be refined. Um, and in 614, uh, among other enhancements, we allow you to um, define which parts of the model, which parts of your cell domain um, uh, can be refined. So again, it gives you a little bit more control and can help, uh, can help with, the, uh, with the overall performance. So, uh, so again, if, if you use cell for these types of analysis, I think this, this, uh, this will be quite useful for you. Um, now I want to move on to some work that's been done in co-stimulation. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, support now in co-stimulation between uh, uh, Abacus and uh, Katia Demola uh, software. So with the release of 614, the logical control system of Gatia's Demola software can now be linked to an Abacus model using this co-simulation technology. So this new functionality will allow various elements of a control system that we have here, such as a hydraulic circuit or a load sensing circuit, to be um, uh, designed and tested and optimized based on realistic simulations of the rigid and deformable mechanical components of the equipment. So in this particular example on the left hand side, on the right hand side, I'm sorry, you see a deformable model of a bucket on some type of excavator. Um, and so the, the, what you can do now is you can design a circuit, uh, some type of control system using actuators and sensors, you know, inside of the MOLA, and you can couple that to an abacus simulation where the, the realistic simulation is taking into account the stresses that develop in different parts of the model, as the different boundary conditions, as it interacts with the soil. So it gives you a very complete environment, you know, to design and optimize a control system while getting realistic feedback. And this is just another, uh, this is just another view of this. Um, on the lower left of the uh, of this slide, you know, the movements of a backhoe, um, uh, the you know the arm, are you see this is a simplified way that the MOLA sees this analysis. In the upper right, you see a higher fidelity abacus model of the backhoe, which can be used to provide accurate feedback to the control systems. So the, um, uh, I just want to mention here again that this, this co-simulation technology is another way that we open up uh, our, uh, our smoothest technology to expand the range of problems that you can solve. And again, to remind you that the co-simulation engine is not just limited to Smooly or DS products. You know, we've demonstrated over the years that can, COSIM can be used to uh, couple Abacus to a wide range of third-party software as well. Okay. So um, moving on, I want to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about our solvers and performance. Um, our solver group, uh, as again, as usual, is always focused on and continually pushing the boundaries of performance, improving robustness. Um, in the past release, a couple of the things that we've been focusing on is a GP-GPU acceleration of our AMS Eigensolver. Um, we've done in some improvements to our constraint solver for, for our AMS Eigensolver. We also have expanded uh, uh, domain parallelization to, for our discrete or DAEM elements, as well as some uh, domain uh, parallelization of thermal ties, which I mentioned earlier. The uh, uh, graph that we sh you're looking at here is showing the performance improvements for our constraint solver using AMS. AMS is a high-performance uh, uh, frequency extraction uh, tool, and um, it uses a constraint solver in cases where you have things with Lagrange multipliers. So this includes things like fasteners, 
um, some types of uh, our connectors, um, different types of uh, couplings. Uh, these guys all have uh, Lagrange multipliers, which we use our constraint solver. And so in, in uh, 614, um, we have improved the performance of, of the constraint solver to reduce the, the wall clock time for, for runs. So this, again, this, this should, uh, you know, the, in the typical, uh, uh, the typical um, uh, you're looking at speed of about order factor of two, you know, so that that's, that's quite, can be quite uh, uh, useful for, for large models. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have been working on uh, uh, enhancing our GPU capability. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been uh, enabling different parts of the solver to leverage GPU uh, cards that are al already on a lot of your systems. So the idea here is to try to leverage the existing hardware on your systems, um, you know, to, to help analysis run faster. And as in the slide showing, we've we've uh, extended this in 614 uh, to the AMS Eigen Solver. The uh, graph that you sh that you see here is showing the speed up that we got on on a particular model. This particular model it was a full vehicle uh, model. It's got nine million degrees of freedom. They're extracting uh, almost 11,000 Eigen Eigen modes. And we're just showing the different types of speed up we get in the uh, overall standard time and the AMS time. The AMS time is in blue. And so you can see, you know, between 614 and 613, using the same system C with 16 cores, if you use one GPU, um, you're getting a speed up of about a factor about 2.3 in the AMS solve and 1.5 in, in the standard solve. Um, in this particular case, if you use G two GPUs, it actually doesn't enhance performance. So it seems like for this particular analysis, one GPU is kind of the sweet spot for this. This is the type of thing that we continue to improve. You know, we continue to work on. But again, the the idea here is to try to leverage uh, soft, the hardware that you already have on your system to improve the the performance of Abacus runs. We've also, as I mentioned, uh, we've uh, uh, parallelized our uh, DEM or discrete elements. Um, discrete elements are is a, is a fun, is a particle technique inside of Abacus Explicit for modeling uh, basically particles, particles that interact through contact as opposed to SPH where they interact through um, the constitutive model. So the animations you see are two typical examples. At the bottom we see just a mixing operation. Maybe this is from a pharmaceutical simulation or some type of uh, industrial example. The, um, on the, the top animation is an animation of a, uh, some type of uh, particles flowing through a chute. And again, just pointing out, DEM is a, it was released in 613. Um, in 614, we've continued to enhance it. But the, the advantage, you know, or one of the nice features here is that our DEM particles um, can interact with traditional Lagrangian uh, conventional elements. So in, in this case, you have these particles which are being pushed through a chute, um, and the chute is modeled with shells, um, and so you can get the contact interactions between the DM particles and that chute, which you can then use those stresses for, uh, again, a failure analysis or a fatigue analysis if you want to do a long-term study on, on a particular design. So in 6.14, uh, we've you know, we've trying to improve the performance of DEM by enabling uh, domain uh, parallelization. Um, you know, so this this should improve the the run times. Okay, I want to uh, move on now to uh, linear dynamics. Um, and linear dynamics uh, have been involved in a number of different developments in the past year. Um, we've uh, extended our AMS Eigen Solver for handling coupled structural acoustic problems, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the last couple of slides. But we've also um, have enabled acoustic pressures to be an excitation, an excitation mode in a modal analysis. In previous releases, um, you couldn't actually have the acoustic pressures driving a modal analysis. You um, so this, this, is, this is new functionality, which in, should enhance the range of problems you can solve. They've done a number of enhancements um, for our matrix input capability. The matrix input capability allows you to take uh, behavior 
from that you've developed either on your own or from another software and bring that that uh, that behavior that you know that stiffness or mass matrices from third party software bring it into an abacus analysis so we've introduced a number of things to make it easier for you to input these quantities to do quality checks so that you can check the the conditioning of these matrices that you're bringing in um so there's a there's a number of features again I'm not going to talk about those uh, today I'm going to have to refer you to the to release notes for those, and also support for uh, uh, with our substructuring capability for generating flexible body, uh, which can be used uh, in for flexible body dynamic simulations. Um, but I am going to focus here in the next couple of slides on the coupled uh, acoustic structural eigenmodes for the AMS eigensolver. So this is when you're doing a modal analysis. Um, in in a situation where you have coupling between uh, an acoustic and a structure, and this is really uh, useful for when that coupling is strong, and that means that the that you that the eigen modes of your system really uh, are are affected whether and depending on whether or not you include the coupling between the structure and the acoustic uh, uh, domains of your model. Uh, typically, where this, these types of modes are important, or this type of coupling is important, is uh, for underwater analysis. You know, this is an example of a submarine. Here you have uh, water, which is fairly heavy, uh, interacting uh, with the uh, metal structure of the submarine. Here, the coupling is actually uh, quite strong, and you can see the the effect of this in the two plots on the bottom. Um, what we're showing here is two different um, uh, two different pressure uh, uh, frequency response plots. The on the lower left hand corner, you see the uh, the red model. The red graph is actually a uh, frequency response using a direct uh, steady state dynamic solver. So this is a this is not a modal analysis. It's fully direct, so it automatically takes into account the coupling. Um, but it can be more expensive than a modal analysis. So what people want to do a lot of times is they want to use a modal technique because they can get a faster response. But the blue, um, the uh, the blue model here is the frequency response that you get with a modal technique when you use uncoupled modes. So you can see that in this case the two analyses do not match up well. So and that's because the coupling between the fluid and the structure is actually quite strong. The plot that you see on the lower right um, is. Again, you have the uh, the model using the direct, which hasn't changed, but the uh, the the, um, the the graph, the green plot, which lines up you know much nicer with the direct solution, is the modal solution when you use these uh, coupled modes. So this is a case where you can see that the uh, that the coupled modes are very important, uh, and that we can now take that into account. Uh, this is another analysis. Again, this is a this is a tire analysis, but here the uh, the air inside the tire is being uh, is being taken into account. And again, given the fact that this is a closed cavity, um, uh, the uh, the coupling between the air inside the tire and the tire itself is actually quite important. And then again, you were showing here the, the the comparison between a coupled mode solution and an uncoupled mode solution compared to a direct solution. And so you can see again on the lower right hand side that taking into account the coupled modes is quite important for this type of analysis. Uh, this analysis um, is showing the performance improvements that we can get with the coupled AMS. In previous releases we had we had uh, we had supported uh, coupled modes for our Lancho's eigensolver. Um, you know, which is it can be quite effective, but for extremely large problems, uh, the AMS eigensolver is much more efficient. So this is uh, an example of a, of a full body model. There's you know 2.6 million degrees of freedom, and we're extracting a thousand coupled modes, and we're doing a frequency response plot up to 150 hertz. And so you, the the plot you show there that we that you see there is a frequency response of the pressure comparing, um, again, in this case, coupled and uncoupled modes. And in this particular case, you can see that the coupling here is a little bit weaker. So uh, using coupled or uncoupled modes is, is not quite as, as important. Um, and, and the lower uh, right-hand corner, what we're showing is we're showing the uh, uh, performance numbers between coupled Lanchos and coupled AMS. 
So on the coupled land shows, um, the solution took about three hours, 180 minutes, but if you use coupled AMS, um, it only took uh, just a bit over a half hour. So, you know, a pretty good performance improvement. And the last one is showing with AMS solver using the uncoupled modes. In this case, it was only 11 minutes. So this, again, in this particular case, uh, uh, using a couple modes was not terribly important for the final solution, but if it was, you know, this, the, the, the point of this, this, uh, this slide is to show that you can get very good uh, performance extracting the couple modes using AMS. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is some improvements that we've uh, done for Abacus CAE. Um, development on Abacus CAE uh, remains um, uh, you know, uh, uh, still quite a bit of effort putting on, on Abacus CAE. And in 6.14, um, the main focus on 6.14 was really focused on performance. There was, there was lots of smaller enhancements to, again, improve usability um, and robustness, but a lot of the work was really focused on improving performance, especially for uh, models, large models with lots of sections, uh, definitions, lots of sets, you know, and I'll show some slides on that uh, going forward. But we've also um, updated our uh, support for different associated interfaces, and I'll, I'll, I will show some slides, I'll show a slide on that. We've done some enhancements to our view cuts to um, give you more control over, uh, you know, um, uh, what kind of uh, data you can post process from our view cuts. We've done some enhancements to our uh, APIs for our ODBs. Some enhancements to our Sketcher to, you know, to make it easier for you to create your models. And we've also uh, some functionality to make it easier for you to access the Simulia learning community directly from Abacus CAE. But the, uh, the, the ones I want to go into a little more detail is first I mentioned uh, we've updated uh, our uh, associative interfaces for a wide range of products, for Pro-E, for NX, um, SolidWorks, CATIA. And the, again, the associative interfaces are interfaces that allow you to, uh, if you're creating geometry inside one of, these, uh, one of these CAD packages, and then you want to bring that, the, that geometry into CAE, where you can use it to create an abacus model, these Associative interfaces are designed to automatically transfer any changes you make from one product back and forth to the other. So again, it, it makes it easier if you're making, you know, if you're setting up an abacus model inside a CEA based on some uh, geometry imported, for example, from CATIA. Um, the interface, if you go back and you tweak the geometry inside a CATIA, the those changes are automatically uh, picked up inside CAE. Um, for your for your uh, for your abacus model, so again, it 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 makes it easier to create models uh, uh, to use these these different tools in conjunction with one another. Um, as I mentioned, there was a lot of work on improving the performance and uh, for for models, especially with large uh, numbers of sets. The graph we show here is the time to write input files for um, models including numbers of sets. So you can see that the number of sets for this particular model um, starts goes from zero up to about 5,000 sets. Um, and the two plots are showing the, the time, the wall clock time it took to write these input files comparing uh, 613 in red to 614 in blue. And so you can see the, you know, for uh, this particular uh, model here, the with 5,000 sets inside the model, it took under five minutes to write in Abacus uh, with 614, where in 613 it took almost 25 minutes. So there you see um, a you know a, a five-fold uh, reduction in, in time, or a factor of five. Um, so this is again, if, if this just in, allows you to create more efficiently larger models inside of uh, Abacus CAE. Um, and then this is uh, another uh, couple plots that show um, some performance improvements. The first model, um, again, we're, we're comparing re uh, performance time between 613 and 614. In the first model, it had you know had uh, 300 parts, about 3,600 element sets, 2,400 node sets, and 600 section definitions. 
you know, the the um, the average time to write out these uh, input files, you know, went down by a factor of about five in um, 614. The second model was larger, you know, 500 parts, 5,000 element sets, you know, 11,500 node sets, you know, many sections, lots of orientations, you know, 2,200 connector sections, and a lot of contact pairs. And the uh, here the you only get almost get two orders of magnitude improvement in the time to 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 write these files out between 613 and 614. So you can see there's some very dramatic improvements in in the performance of of advocacy, which I which I mentioned was a which was the particular focus of for our CAE team uh, in 614. And that brings me to the end of uh, of this presentation. So. Uh, Abacus 614, you know, we believe again is a very strong release, and you know it is the the foundation for the Samuli extended uh, packaging portfolio. Now, a lot of the enhancements that we talked about today and I mentioned were driven by our customers. A lot of heavily requested uh, functionality was put in. For example, you know things like the uh, output at the last converged increment. Um, there was a large focus on contact, you know, getting edge contact into Abacus standard. There was a large focus on XFEM, um, improving the range of functionality as well as the robustness and performance. You know, we had a uh, focus on linear dynamics um, in our solvers and uh, the materials. So there, there was a wide range of things that we focused on. And again, as I mentioned a number of times, uh, you know, this is only a small cross-section of what's actually went into Abacus 614. So I do encourage you to take a look at the release notes to, for, you know, for a full list, you know, of what's been uh, put into into this release. So I appreciate your um, your time. I hope that you found this to be a useful uh, presentation, and um, and thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. For those of you that would like more information on the enhancements in Abacus 614, uh, I can provide you with these few tips on where to go. First of all, I encourage you to visit our website. It's 3ds.com slash Simulia. On that website, you can find out how to contact and get in touch with your local Simulia office who can provide you more of the details of these and the other products. I invite you to attend our upcoming Fall 2014 Regional User Meetings. You can also find a schedule of those meetings on the website. You can visit the Simulia Learning Community, which is a great place to find out more about the technology and the applications that are possible with the product suite. I would also encourage you to submit your questions about the content of today's e-seminar at the links provided in the learning community where you accessed this material. Uh, type your question in the text box and someone from Simulia will uh, provide an answer in a short period of time and you'll be notified that the answer is available. And finally, please subscribe to Simulia Community News and keep in touch with us through social media. All right, let's move on to the next section of today's e-seminar. All right, I'm pleased to have with me presenting software developments in the new release of EpiSafe version 6.5. I'm pleased to have with me John Draper. John is a well-known figure worldwide in the finite element community and particularly with respect to uh, fatigue and durability simulation based on finite element analysis. John is the founder of Safe Technology, the company behind EpiSafe and a company that was acquired by Deso Systems in 2013. So please welcome John Draper. John? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is an overview of the developments that we've done for FESAFE 6.5. <clears throat> I want to do a little bit about the background to FESAFE. You may not be as familiar with FESAFE as you are with Abacus. Uh, I then want to focus on four major developments that we've done uh, in FESAFE 6.5 and just summarize some other of the smaller developments that we've done as well. So let's do a little bit of background on FESAFE. 
this is where FE Safe fits into the system. We take the stress uh, output from the finite element model. We can also take forces, um, strains, temperatures, other things. Uh, we combine that with information about the service loading, and then FE Safe calculates fatigue lives and safety factors at each node on the model. So we can plot fatigue life contours and other contours in Habakkuk CAE. I'll say a little bit about the basic algorithms that we are using in FESAFE because that puts some of the new developments into context. So if we have a finite element model and the fatigue loading consists of many different time histories of load applied at different points on the model and in different directions, then we can take a node and one possible crack initiation mode for this model would be if the dark area is the surface of the model then the crack will initiate on a plane of shear strain and the driver for that crack initiation is a combination of shear strains and normal strains. If the loading is complex and we have complex biaxial stress conditions here then we may have to search around and find which direction that crack will initiate in. And we call this critical plane searching. It still initiates at 45 degrees to the surface, but we may have to search around and find which direction, which angle this is. So we can calculate the life to the initiation of a short crack. And then at some point, the crack will turn uh, into the propagation mode and in FE Safe now we can look below the surface and see whether that crack really will propagate. And the methods that we use are called the theories of critical distance, uh, TCD, uh, and that's been one of our major developments in FE Safe 6.5. The crack may initiate perpendicular to the surface, again on a shear plane. And again, the driver will be a combination of shear and normal strains on that plane. And again, if we have complex multi-axial loading, a complex biaxial stress state, then we may have to search around and find which direction the crack will actually initiate in. And this process is called critical plane searching to find which direction the crack will initiate in. Those two cracking modes are possible for ductile metals, which in fatigue is actually most metals. If it's a brittle metal, such as a cast iron or a cast aluminium, then the crack may simply initiate in response to normal strains. There is no shear component. And again, if we have complex multi-axial stresses, we may have to search around and find which direction that crack will initiate in. And we can look below the surface for this type of cracking as well and see if the crack will actually propagate once it's initiated. So we have two modes which apply to ductile metals and then this one mode at the bottom uh, which applies to brittle metals such as cast irons and cast aluminiums. So that's the process for one node on the surface of the model. We can then repeat that for every node and generate the fatigue life contour plots. And FE, FE Safe makes the choice of algorithm. Is it going to be shear cracking like the ones at the top, or is it going to be perpendicular cracking? It chooses that algorithm automatically. The user doesn't have to do anything. And it switches on critical plane searching on a node by node basis, depending on whether it's necessary or not. So this makes the code very easy to use, and it also makes it very fast. So let's look then at some of the developments that we've done for FE Safe 6.5. And the first one I'll look at is the theory of critical distances. <clears throat> the basis of crack initiation is that cracks initiate from the surface of our component, usually. Uh, and the crack initiation life is determined by the surface stresses and strains, the sequence of those strains. 
So we could simulate it using a smooth specimen of material if we put the same stresses and strains on the smooth specimen. So that's a calculation of the life to crack initiation. We can then check whether the crack will actually propagate or not. And we use the information on the subsurface stresses in the model. So what we've shown here is the stress reducing as we move into the material. And whether the crack will propagate or not depends on the stress some distance below the surface. And that distance is a material property, and it's called the critical distance for the material. In the FE Safe database now, we are starting to put critical distance values for some of the materials. If you don't know them, it's quite easy to measure. Uh, there is a simple approximation formula as well. So this stress determines the life to crack initiation. This stress determines whether the crack will propagate or not. We used to call this notch sensitivity in fatigue, but this is a term that we don't really use anymore. So if we have a high strength steel, the critical distance will be very small. It's typically of the order of a tenth of a millimeter. So there may be very little difference between the two stresses, and so if a crack initiates, it will almost certainly propagate. And we used to call these materials very notch sensitive. If a crack initiated, it would almost certainly propagate. If we look at the opposite extreme, which could be a gray cast iron, then the critical distance can be quite large, two, three, four millimeters. So there may be a big difference now between these two stresses, and so there may be a good chance that if a crack initiates, it will not propagate to failure. So we have been working on implementing the theory of critical distances now for several years, eight years, I think. Uh, the 6.5 release is our best release yet of the theory of critical distances. So FE-SAFE will calculate the life to crack initiation, and it will calculate the factor of strength, how much you need to change the stresses to achieve the life that you want. And it will do those calculations using the surface stresses. And then if you request it, it will look below the surface and see if the crack is going to propagate. And if it will not propagate, then FE-SAFE will work out how much you could increase the stresses so you get to the point where it just won't propagate. So this gives you a lighter, more efficient, more highly stressed structure. Uh, but it does mean that you are uh, changing your design philosophy, you're accepting that initial cracking. So to do this calculation, we now interpolate stresses on planes which are perpendicular to the surface. This isn't really mesh refinement, but it's extracting more stress information for us so that we can get a really good estimate of the subsurface stresses. Then we recalculate the critical plane orientation because the amount of biaxiality may be different below the surface. And we recalculate the safety factor. And we can now support first and second order hex and tech meshes. So if we look at it slightly differently, um, we've got a crack initiating on a shear plane here. This is the life to crack initiation. This is the critical distance, the point at which the crack turns and propagates. And we are calculating whether that crack will in fact propagate or not. So to give you an example, this is a public domain a model of an engine crankshaft. Uh, when you're modeling engines, you tend to model two rotations of the crankshaft, uh, and that whole sequence of stresses is contained in the finite element model. FE-SAFE chains all of those together to do the fatigue life calculation. And this shows the results plotted in Abacus if we just use the surface stresses and do the life to crack initiation, this component fails. We need to reduce the stresses to achieve the life that we want. 
But if we then recalculate our safety factors based on subsurface stresses, the stresses at the critical distance, then our factor of strength is greater than one. And so this design now passes. And it passes because we are accepting that initial cracking and saying we're going to base our design on non-propagation of those cracks. So that's an example of the use of critical distances in a practical application. We are also now starting to use them for the analysis of cut threads, which are quite difficult to mesh, uh, and for some quite complex analyses connected with fretting of materials when they're in contact with each other. The second big development that we've done is in the field of vibration fatigue. FE Safe for a long time has had the ability to superimpose steady state solutions, steady state modal solutions. We've also been able to superimpose transient dynamic solutions, which is the model is being driven in the time domain. What we've been working on for the past two years and what we have released for the first time in FE Safe 6.5 is a pure frequency domain analysis. And I'll use this little beach buggy to illustrate what we've been doing. So this beach buggy has uh, four loads being applied at the wheel mounting points, but they're not applied in the time domain. They're applied in the frequency domain. So these are the PSDs, the power spectral densities of the four loads being applied. In fatigue, the phasing between loads is very important. And so if the user has cross-spectrum information, we can also use that in our methodology. And this retains phase information. So in the finite element model, we model unit load PSDs. Uh, we get the uh, frequency response functions. In this case, we've put three loads on this model. We've got three unit load frequency response functions. <laughs> they are read into FE safe and they are combined with PSDs of loading at different points on the model and those PSDs can be any shape. And then FE safe calculates the PSDs, the power spectrums of each component of the stress tensor at this particular node. Uh, or it can calculate the uh, PSD of the von Mises stress at that particular node on the model. And then that feeds into our fatigue analysis, critical plane fatigue analysis. I'll just say a little bit about the fatigue analysis. Uh, we've got PSDs of stresses at the node. What we need to do is convert that into something that we can do a fatigue analysis from. And we do that by taking moments of the PSD about this axis, the zero hertz axis. And we can generate some really useful fatigue information from those moments. So, for example, these two moments, the second and the zeroth moment, give us the number of times the signal crosses zero or the stress response crosses zero uh, with a positive slope. And this function of the moment, the fourth moment and the second moment, gives us the number of peaks per unit time. And we can calculate the RMS value of our uh, stress history as well using just the area under the PSD. And if we make an assumption that this is a Gaussian process, then we have a complete descriptor of our fatigue analysis process. So we can take the two things we've just calculated, the distribution of peaks and the number of times the signal crosses zero. We can calculate other functions and introduce the moments again. And from that set of parameters, we can calculate uh, a number of other constants, which we can feed into an equation which gives us the probability distribution of rain flow cycles. And obviously, it's the rain flow cycles which are the things we need to analyze the fatigue damage. 
The equation gives us the probability of rain flow cycle ranges for a process which has a unit RMS. Uh, we can then scale the stresses by the actual RMS to get the actual distribution of rain flow cycles. So we can take the PSD of a function on the critical plane, and from that PSD we can calculate the rain flow cycles, and then we can do the fatigue analysis. This is actually a report that I did about 20 years ago for the wind energy industry. Uh, and it's looking at the magnitude of cycles, strain ranges, which are on the horizontal axis, and the numbers of cycles on the vertical axis. So this is like a cycle histogram. Uh, and I've compared um, the histogram that you would get if you rain flow counted the time history of strain compared with the one you get from the PSD, and you can see they're virtually identical. And obviously, if the distribution of rainflow cycles is virtually identical, then the calculation of fatigue life will be virtually identical as well. So in the finite element model, we do our modal solution. We get the modal-based steady-state response. Um, this gives us our frequency response functions, which we can export from Abagus into the ODB file. The rest of the diagram is FE safe. We can input the PSDs of our loads. We can input the cross-spectral density information as well. We can calculate the PSD of the von Mises stress, or we can calculate the PSD of our damage function on the critical plane. Either of those can be fed through those moments of the PSD so that we can calculate the distribution of rain flow cycles. Uh, we can then say how long we want our model to be exposed to that PSD, um, combine that with our material properties to do the fatigue life calculation or the fatigue damage calculation. If we look at this diagram on the top left-hand corner, this is our definition of loading. And on the diagonal, we have the PSDs of each of the loads that we're applying. And the rest of the matrix contains the cross-spectral information between each pair of PSDs. So that gives us our phase information. Just to give you an idea of the quantity of data that we might be using, one of the car companies has asked us to populate an 80 by 80 matrix of file names which contain all the PSD and cross-spectral information. So that's 6,400, I think, um, files containing this information. To show you how important the phase is, what we have here is the PSD of the stresses at one point on our model. Uh, if we ignore phase and assume that the two loads on this uh, little strip are cycli cycling in phase, then we get the black response to mode shapes. If we're assuming that they are cycling out of phase, as we've shown on the right-hand side, then we get quite different response. So that's the importance of including phase information in our loading if we can retain it. So the user interface for this feature, we open the finite element model for a PSD analysis. Uh, this opens the ODB results file. Uh, this has our modal stresses and our modal participation factors in it. In FE Safe, we also input the matrix containing the PSDs and the cross-spectral density information. So that's the definition of our problem in FE Safe. If we then look at the left hand side here where our loading is being set up, we actually have two blocks of loading. So this first block could be the PSDs for our vehicle driving over one surface on the proving ground. The second block could be the set of PSDs for the loads when the vehicle rides over a second surface, different surface on our proving ground. So we can set up multiple blocks representing different types of loading. These can be different proving ground surfaces, different wind states on a wind turbine, um, many things. To improve computational efficiency, we can allow the export from 
the finite element model of unequally sampled PSDs or frequency response functions. So we can cluster the data around the peaks in the response. This gives us a lot less data uh, and it means that we can get a more accurate analysis because we've got more data points around the peaks in the responses. <clears throat> and this shows our beach buggy when we've gone through the process of doing the fatigue life prediction. This is one example of an input PSD of load applied at one point. We've actually got four different PSDs applied at the four different load points, the four different wheels. Um, this is an example of the stress response at one node on the model. And these are the fatigue life contours showing the fatigue lives. The red is the hot spot uh, at this point on the finite element model. <clears throat> there are a number of advantages of working in the frequency domain. Computationally, it's very fast, probably two orders of magnitude faster than working with long signals in the time domain. It's been the most requested feature in FE Safe now for many years. Uh, most of our competitors have this functionality. Uh, we delayed doing ours until we were sure that we had a good technical solution. And we think now that this is the best technical solution of any of the commercially available fatigue software. It combines a very sophisticated treatment of the PSDs with the advanced critical plane searching technology, which is the heart of our fatigue damage calculation. In FESAFE 6.5, for the first time, we've released distributed processing using the uh, Simulia licensing system. And this is a schematic of the distributed processing capability in FESAFE. So if we look at the right-hand side, we have a definition of a cluster. Uh, these are the nodes, the boxes, if you like, um, on the cluster. Each one of these can be a multi-core um, computer, so we can do multi-core analysis on each of the nodes in the cluster. <clears throat> the master node is the one that controls the process, but that can also be one of the analysis nodes as well. And the process can be driven from an interactive workstation or from a command line workstation uh, using batch files or uh, command files. Or it can be embedded in another process so we can run the whole thing from inside another application, a third party application. So we're dis distributing the job over a number of analysis nodes. Each of those analysis nodes can be a multi-core processor so we can get very large increases in speed. In terms of licensing, FE, a single FE safe license uh, supports multiple cores, typically up to 32 cores. You don't need extra licenses to run multi-core analysis, but obviously you do need extra licenses for each of the analysis nodes. So this, is show, this shows the scalability of the uh, distributed processing. Uh, Roughly when we double the number of cores, um, the number of nodes or the number of um, cores within a node, we get an almost scalable increase in speed. Um, and that goes up very high, 30 or more uh, nodes. We're still getting linear increases in speed. So this is a very scalable process. Those developments apply to the standard FE safe. We have a new development for one of the add-on modules, which is the Verity method for welded joint analysis. This is separately licensed as an add-on module. <laughs> the Verity method is a method of fatigue analysis of welded joints. The work, we've been do the work that we've been doing is to improve the scalability, I'm sorry, to improve the usability of um, the Verity method. This shows the various modes in which a weld can crack, cracking from the toe, cracking across the throat, uh, cracking from the root. And our new functionality automatically identifies the weld and then automatically identifies those crack planes, their location and their orientation. That's for a T-joint. We can do the same thing for a lap shear joint. 
So the user simply defines where the weld is. Um, FE Safe extracts all the elements. It drops cones down from the surface so that it can find all the nodes which will lie adjacent to the crack plane. Um, create separate element groups for each of the possible cracking modes. It automatically aligns the forces uh, perpendicular to each of those different cracking modes, uh, and it calculates fatigue lives for each of those different cracking modes as well. So this is a highly automated process. Uh, it makes the Verity method much easier to use than it was before. Look very briefly at some of the other developments. There are a large number of developments have gone into FE Save 6.5. Uh, you should check the release notes for a detailed description of all the developments. But these are some of the major ones. Uh, FE Safe now is a 64 bit implementation across all our Windows and Linux platforms, all the supported platforms. One of the requested uh, capabilities that we've had from many users is to take unaveraged nodal data from the ODB or from uh, other finite element codes and actually average the, the nodal data, produce nodal average data as we read the model into FE Safe. This is to reduce the size of the files and to increase the uh, analysis speed. So we've released that with this release for Abacus, for ANSYS, and for NASTRAN. In Abacus, you can divide the model into different groups of elements so that in FE Safe we could assign different properties to those different groups, different surface finishes, perhaps different materials. But in this release, we can automatically now identify groups depending on different materials and different sections, so the user doesn't have to do any additional definition. We can automatically read that information from the model. And we can do that for Abacus, and we can do that for Nastran as well. A lot of our users import their own materials data into the FE Safe database. Uh, we used to enforce a template structure on that import and export capability. We've now made that template free. Uh, so it's a completely open format that you can now use to import data into the FE Safe Materials database. So that's a big improvement in usability for those people who are testing their own materials. So just as a summary then, uh, we think this is a very strong release of FE Safe. Uh, it's got some really important new technology in it, the frequency based fatigue, uh, vibration fatigue, and the enormous improvements we've made to our implementation of the theory of critical distances. The distributed processing has been, been released for the first time with Abacus licensing. Uh, and we've made some major improvements to the usability of the Verity welded joint uh, fatigue analysis. Uh, and if you check the release notes, you can see all the other enhancements that we've made to the code. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, please go to the release notes and uh, see what other things we've done with FE Save 6.5. All right. Thank you, John. Let me remind everyone how you can get more information on the products that were talked about in today's e-seminar. First of all, we encourage you to visit our website at 3ds.com Simulia. On the website, you can find out where your local Simulia office is if you don't know already, and I would encourage you to get in touch with them. They can certainly provide you with much more information on the products and the applications. Each of our local offices has a regional users meeting being planned for this fall of 2014. I encourage you to uh, make plans to attend your local regional users meeting. On the website, you can also visit the Simulia Learning Community. If you haven't become a part of the learning community, I would strongly encourage you to join. This is a great place to uh, find more information, particularly from other users of their applications, their successes, and tips and tricks on our products. 
I would also encourage you to submit your questions about the content of today's e-seminar at the links provided in the learning community where you accessed this material. Uh, type your question in the text box and someone from Somalia will uh, provide an answer in a short period of time. You'll be notified that the answer is available. Finally, please feel free to subscribe to Simulia Community News and connect with us on social media. So with that, I'd like to wrap up today's e-seminar and thank once again our speakers, Chris Walliver and John Draper. Thank you everyone for your time.